What's cracking, Chemistry Minions? Today and What's the Matter, we're going to learn how all those elements out there in the world bond together and form chemical compounds. So buckle up, get your seats in the upright position, stay home. ways in which our elements in the world connect with one another and form chemical bonds. This means that all of our atoms will grab onto other atoms by either covalent bonds, ionic bonds, or metallic bonds. When electrons are being shared between two atoms, the two atoms will get stuck together by what is called a covalent bond. When electrons are either lost or gained, or in other words, they are transferred from one atom to another, those two elements are bonded together through what is called an ionic bond. When metal atoms are floating in what we call a sea of electrons, that metal atom is said to contain metallic bonds. The driving force behind why atoms will either share, transfer, or float in electrons is the command that all atoms follow, which is the octet rule. The octet rule states that atoms will either gain, lose, or share electrons until they are surrounded by eight valence electrons. Group 18 noble gas elements are already surrounded by eight valence electrons, and that is why they do not bond with other elements. To better understand how elements share electrons to form compounds, let's take a closer look at the most widespread covalent compound on Earth, water. Water is a chemical combination of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Each hydrogen atom contains one valence electron and a valence shell that can fit two electrons. So hydrogen's out there trying to find another electron to fill its valence shell. The one oxygen atom in a molecule of water contains six valence electrons. So in order to satisfy the octet rule, the oxygen atom needs two more electrons in its valence shell. To achieve the octet rule, both hydrogen atoms will share their single electrons with the oxygen atom, giving the oxygen its eight valence electrons and hydrogen the two that they want as well. Each covalent bond will contain only two electrons and all the electrons in a molecule will rearrange themselves to minimize the repulsive forces coming from the negatively charged electrons. The bonded elements of a covalent compound and how they are arranged can be represented in one of two ways, either through an electron dot structure or through a structural formula. In an electron dot structure, we show the shared electrons between the two atoms being held together with two dots, and this represents a single covalent bond. In a structural formula, instead of using two dots for the shared electrons in a single covalent bond, we use a single dash or line between the two atoms. In both cases, we have to show that every atom in the compound is satisfied the octet rule. So when the structure is drawn, we do not leave out any of the electrons, including those that are not being shared. A pair of valence electrons that are not being shared with any other atom are called lone pairs of electrons, and they are shown by just having the two dots left off by themselves. Our example of a water compound shows us that every water molecule has two lone pairs of electrons. The majority of our covalent compounds will form between nonmetals, which we know from the Elements Assemble video are the elements on the right side of the periodic table. But there are other types of molecules out there in the world that also contain covalent bonds. Out of the 118 elements in the world, seven of them only exist when they are bonded with another atom of themselves, and we call them diatomic molecules. These molecules are made up of two of the same atoms bonded together, and di just happens to be the prefix for two. To show that all diatomic molecules have two atoms in them, we use the subscript two next to the symbol, and a phrase I like to use to remember which elements form diatomic molecules is horses need oats for clear brown eyes. There are also polyatomic ions, which as the name applies are charged molecules consisting of multiple atoms being covalently bonded together. We represent polyatomic ions by using the chemical symbols of the atoms in the ion, subscripts to show how many of each atom, and superscripts to show the charge of the ion, just like we see here in this table of common polyatomic ions. 
Finally, there are covalent compounds that consist of multiple covalent bonds between two atoms. But an atom cannot satisfy the octet rule by sharing one pair of electrons with another atom. It will then share two or three pairs of electrons with a single atom. This results in the formation of either a double bond if two pairs of electrons are shared like we see in the diatomic molecule of oxygen or a triple bond if three pairs of electrons are shared like we see here in the diatomic molecule of nitrogen. The other main type of chemical bonds involves ions and that good old saying we all know, opposites attract. As we learned from the atomic architecture video, when a neutral atom gains or loses electrons, it becomes an ion. Due to the position of the valence electrons in all of our metals, it is easier for metal atoms to lose the electrons and become ions that are positively charged, which we call cations. For our nonmetals on the right side of the periodic table, it is easier for those atoms to gain electrons to fill their valence shell, and the negatively charged ion, which results from the extra electrons, are called anions. We write the charges of an ion, which we call the oxidation states, in superscript form next to the chemical symbol. So all of our metals will have positive oxidation states and all of our nonmetals will have negative oxidation states. The formation of an ionic bond occurs when metal atoms transfer electrons to nonmetal atoms and the resulting charged particles are electrostatically attracted to each other. An example of an ionic bond is when a sodium atom transfers its one valence electron to the valence shell of a chlorine atom, and the positively charged sodium and negatively charged chlorine bind together. Ionic compounds are overall neutral molecules that form rigid three-dimensional arrangements called lattice structures due to the ions being drawn together and organizing into a solid framework of repeating alternating charges. Most ionic compounds will be crystalline solids at room temperature, generally have high melting points due to the large attractive forces within the structure, and will conduct electricity when the ions are allowed to move freely, such as when they are dissolved in a gas or liquid. At last, we use chemical formulas to represent molecules and compounds and a system of nomenclature to give each compound a unique chemical name. Naming covalent compounds, which will be nonmetals with nonmetals, we must account for the different atoms in the compound, and we must include how many of each there are by using the prefixes in this table. Finally, the element in the lower group number is written first, and the ending of the second element is changed to IDE. So in our example of water with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, the chemical name would be dihydrogen monoxide, or just dihydrogen oxide, because we do not need to use the prefix or subscript for one. In the names of ionic compounds, we do not use prefixes for the number of atoms. Roman numerals are used when a transition metal is the cation, but most importantly, the total net charge of the overall compound is neutral. So that means the sum of the positive charges and negative charges that come from the cations and anions must equal zero. A nice trick you can use to determine the number of cations and anions in an ionic compound is to write out the chemical symbols and oxidation states of each ion, and then use a crisscross method with just the numbers to see how many of each are needed to offset the positive and negative charges. For the ionic compound aluminum oxide, each aluminum cation carries a plus three charge, while each oxygen anion has a minus two charge. So after crisscross, we see that it takes two aluminum atoms to cancel out and offset the negative charges that are coming from the three oxygen atoms, giving us a final chemical formula of Al2O3. All right, everyone, now that we know about chemical bonds, use those awesome notes that you just created and take a stab at these practice problems. That's it. We did it. Thanks for watching, everyone. You're the best. Thanks for watching. You matter.